Chapter Ten of Curly by Roger Pocock. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Ten: Storm Gathering. It's a whole lot interesting to see how different sorts of people put up a fight. Cat, she spits and proceeds with claws. Dog, he says no remarks but opens up with teeth. Horse, he's mighty swift to paw. Bull he hugs bear he hugs affectionate while he eats your face frenchman he pokes with a sword german he slashes spaniard he throws his knife nigger he barbers around with a razor and all of us had the same feelings to express in some heartfelt sudden way if you're looking for trouble with mr cowboy you want to tame yourself and get pretty near absent before he shoots but at present my mind is set on britishers which is a complicated tribe and they sure fight most areas when mr britisher is merely feeling good and wants to loose out his joy with a little wholesome scrap he naturally hates to kill his man first lick that would spoil future sport so if he's irish he turns himself loose with the club or if he's scotch or english he feels for the other man with a hard paw that relieves him and does no harm but sometimes he feels real warlike there's nobody special he wants to kill his small home tribe has nothing to spare for burial and yet he must have war that's why his government keeps proper hunting preserves well stocked with assorted barbarians overseas some of these savages are sure to be wanting a fight so mr britisher obliges and comes along hot with rifles and maxim guns savages are plenty so that if a few get spoiled they'll never be missed it's good for them says mr britisher and it saves the crockery from being smashed at home so you see how mr britisher may have his peaceful scrapping with another boy or go play with his savages when they want a licking but he's serious none just laughs and shakes hands afterwards but what does he do when he feels real awful and dangerous civilized folk like us americans feeling as bad as that turn loose the guns and wipe each other out to a finish other people may prefer swords or battering rams or a tilt with locomotive engines or cannon loaded with buffalo horns or dynamite at ten paces but all that would feel too tame for mr britisher no he puts on his war paint black suit and top hat most hideous calls on his lawyer in a frantic passion and goes to law now look see how these two families the the chesneys and the ryans went to law they came of the best fighting stock on earth they were whole-blooded irish but they went to law the du chesneys turned the ryans out of their home and country which was bad then the ryans did worse lay low and waited bitter years gathered their strength and struck from behind the cowards old ryan got his enemy corrupted with drink and gambling stole all his cattle left him helpless to fight then seized the home to try and turn a dying lady into the desert he kept within the law but there was not an honest card in his whole game it was foul play and i for one don't blame poor jim for wanting no more law in the fight with ryan and yet i reckon that after the first fifty miles of his trail that day jim's main thoughts were about the dinner he didn't have and by sundown he quit caring who was dead and who was ruined as he racked on with aching bones and a plate horse it was nigh dark when he raised the tough nut mine at grave city against the red of dusk around him lay the rolling yellow swell of the hot grass clumps of scorched cactus blistered hills of rock before him the mine heads and the roofs with sparkling streaks of blue electric lamps he jockeyed his worn horse past the jim crow mine and the house where my cousins lived the mrs jameson 
then on through scattered suburbs till swinging round the corner into the main street he rolled at a canter for the stable yard abreast of the sepulchre saloon he heard his name called and reined up sharp to speak with the small stable boy from ryan's livery who came limping out to meet him through the dust say kid he leaned over in the saddle well nigh falling where shall i find the duke the little one-eyed cripple jerked his thumb back at the sepulchre saloon the duke's in thar he answered jim rolled from the saddle dropped his rein to the ground quit his horse brushed past the cripple and went on without a word he was so stiff he could hardly walk so dead weary that he reeled against the swing doors trying to get them open the cripple helped him and he staggered in the place was crowded but the clash of his spurs along the floor made several punchers turn round lazy asking him to drink because he belonged to their tribe two of the cowboys grabbed him but he broke away and went home beyond the bar on the right were the gambling tables each with its crowd of players and at the third jim saw louisiana on a high seat watching for low-lived joe his partner who dealt the game opposite them he found his father then pushed his way through the crowd to balshannon's side the ivory chips were piled breast high in front of him for play had been high and the duke had had a run of luck the boy watched his father's face flushed high with excitement his feverish eyes his twitching lips and restless fingers at play with the round ivory counters which stood for five thousand dollars won since supper time opposite he looked up at louisiana on the high seat all bald-faced shirt and diamonds guarding his stacks of gold coin with a revolver low-lived joe faced up a card on the deck and passed some chips to balshannon the rest of the players had quit to watch the big game through father i want you says he well jim says balshannon what's the trouble he never looked up but the boy was shaking all over father come i want you the duke staked then rolled a cigarette don't bother me jim says he you'll spoil the run we can't do anything boy for we've lost those cattle ryan has seized the ranch the sheriff's there come out balshannon quivered but joe shoved him a pile of blue chips so santa cruz is gone balshannon drawled and doubled his stake well how's your mother dead balshannon went gray the cigarette dropped from his fingers dead he muttered dead then he looked up with a sort of queer smile anything else he asked quite cheerfully say duke said louisiana i'd hate to see you struck from not watching your game thanks pete balshannon staked out the whole of his winnings then picked up the cigarette struck a match and lighted it slowly come home the boy was whispering come home jim saw the tears rolling down his father's face and splashing on the chips what's the use my boy he said very softly would that bring your mother back come home come home i'm winning back our home then low-lived joe drew a card and as the boy went staggering away a great yell went up balshannon was winning back his home jim says he felt sick when he quit his father cold down the back and the floor was all aslant and spinning round then everything went black and he dropped when he woke up he felt much better lying flat on the floor with iced water trickling over his face that little one-eyed cripple was feeding brandy to him here's luck he gulped that's all right where's my hat come out says little crook you need fresh air jim got up and wriggled loose because he hated being pawed then led the way out past the three fiddlers and the wheezing old harmonium to the door outside there was clear blue moonlight where's my horse says he crook was lighting a cigarette your hoss says he is in the stable he's unsaddled rubbed down 
watered and fed before now i reckon you want to be watered and fed yourself no kid i'm not feeling proud enough for that come on then says crook and watch me eat i'm just a little wolf inside and if i can't feed i'll howl they went to the pie foundry round the corner and when jim saw crook eat he surely got ravenous they both fed tree and severe then strayed back heavy to the street in front of the sepulchre saloon sit on your tail says crook and i'll feed you a cigarette so they sat down on the sidewalk and jim yawned two yards and a quarter at one stretch i can't lay says crook that you're going to be riding to-night so i had your saddles thrown on my buckskin mare i'll be riding my bed on the sleep trail riding a hoss i reckon crook bent forward pulling up his bootlegs by the tags and me too and the duke our hosses are waiting for us at the back door of this saloon you understand i don't says jim do you know youngster that only this morning i buried my mother then i rode a hundred miles and if arizona freezes over to-night we'll go skating for all i care say if the duke gets shot up to-night will you be a lord jim laughed sort of patronizing because he liked the youngster's cheek my father isn't pining for any such thing to-night but suppose he went dead would you be a lord i'd be jim to chesney riding for whatever wages i'm worth a lord what's the use of that but it must be fine it may be good enough for my father but he's irish and he doesn't know any better i'm an american but still you be a lord would my lordship keep my pony from stumbling in front of a stampede of cattle would it save my scalp from apaches or help my little calves when the mountain lions want meat does my blood protect me from rattlesnakes or ryans or skunks but there's the big land grant your people owns over in ireland it's tied up with the entail whatever that means and there's no money in it anyway my tail in the old country doesn't save me from being galled in the saddle here and i'm awfully tired same here sir i'm weary some myself your gun is loaded jim pawed his revolver yes take some more said crook and passed over a handful of cartridges to fill jim's belt jim saw that the cripple was armed why do you talk says he about horses waiting for us and the need of guns and father getting killed what's the trouble my lad the trouble is that ryan has hired that gambling outfit to skin the duke to-night there's men standing round to see he don't leave that house alive now look along the street here to the left across at the mortuary hotel you see old ryan settin' there i do he's waitin' for his son the millionaire young michael he's due with his private car at ten o'clock if michael comes if he comes i say his father reckons to bring him over to call on your father here at the sepulcher that's why the duke is being skinned and that's why ryan's men are watching to see he don't escape alive but what does ryan want he's got our breeding cattle he's taken holy cross my mother's gone we've nothing left to take you have your lives you and the duke ryan and his outfit allow they'll wipe you out when michael comes is that all jim laughed they're thoughtful and painstaking anyway by the way i don't know that my father and i have been shrieking for help as yet if you were the kind of people to make a big song when you're hurt i reckon that we all would just leave you squeal and who is we all you've acted like a white man to-night looking after my poor roan and me like a little brother but why should you care young chap i've never seen you before in my life i don't even know your name my name is crook i works at the stable 
but why should you interfere you may get hurt i wouldn't like that youngster well partner crook shuffled a whole lot nervous i got a message for you from the boys the dukes had nothing but greasers working for him and that's rough on us white men but still he's surely good he's dead straight he don't wear no frills and many a pole puncher broke hungry half dead of thirst has been treated like a son at holy cross we don't amount to much except when you want an enemy or a friend but our tribe is right into this fight a whole heap for them ryans is dirt and if they comes up again you to-night i expect there'll be gunplay first well kid said jim yawning with a big mouth i wish they put it off until tomorrow. your eyes is like boiled eggs try a cigarette to keep you awake can't we get my father away from this house not till the train comes in what's that got to do with me ask no more questions wait you say that michael ryan's due at ten if they lets him come suppose he comes then nothing can save your father nothing on earth as he spoke the sharp screech of the engine rang out from behind the curb and with all its lights a flash the train rolled in End of chapter ten chapter eleven of curly by roger pocock this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter eleven the gunfight before supper that evening a passing traveller carried a letter to my ranch and when my boys found out that there was going to be trouble in town they surely flirted gravel for fear of arriving too late i placed them at a convenient saloon explained my plans made them swear that they would not stray then i went to curly's room and lay low showing no light but watching the mortuary hotel just across the street ryan sat there in his piazza ruddy and full broad and bald as a barn a ripe man with a gray chin beard yes he was a cheery old soul popular with the crowd a power in local politics well qualified on the outside of him for paradise and in the innards of him for the other place i covered him with my gun and wondered where he would go to when he died i expect he would be craving then for some of that lager beer he sipped so peaceful and for the palm-leaf fan which he used to brush off the heat away off to the right i could see jim sitting on the sidewalk in front of the sepulchre little crook was feeding brandy to him and cigarettes to keep him away from sleep then the train came rumbling in let out a screech and stopped it made me laugh to think what a big hurrah there would be presently when the news got wind of that train being held up by robbers and mr michael ryan led away captive yet there seemed to be no excitement the usual buses and buggies came up from the station the ordinary crowd of loafers and then our only cab which crawled to the mortuary to drop one passenger he was a fat young man dressed most surprising in a stovepipe hat a jew fur coat gloves and a smart valise if any of our cowboys had happened around they would have fired a shot for luck to see if he wasn't some new kind of bird but old ryan came down the steps with a roar of welcome michael he shouted where's your palace car have you sunk so low as to come in a mere cab oh mac i could hear mr michael explaining that something was wrong with the car so he'd had to leave her at lordsburg for repairs of course the robbers not seeing the private car had concluded that their prey had failed to arrive and the train was not worth attacking now michael had arrived and after a talk and a drink with his father these two would stroll over to finish the family vengeance on poor balshannon as far as we had missed getting help from the range wolves so matters were getting mighty serious i slipped away to my men boys said i we got to play at robbers to-night 
i reckon but i don't want y'all to get recognized we may be buckin up against the law and get ourselves disliked if we ain't cautious so i took a big black silk handkerchief and cut it up into strips when the shootin begins says i you just tie these round your heads to hide your homely faces now get your horses and come swift i posted the three in the small alley which ran between the sepulchre saloon and the post office beyond it then i went out to guard balshannon being naturally a timid and cautious man i had a brace of revolvers belted on ready for trouble meanwhile young crook in the front of the house was sitting all doubled up with grief at the sight of michael ryan boy says jim what's the matter nothing how is it young un that you know all about my father's affairs and mine i expect says the one-eyed cripple that working my job at the livery i'd ought to know what comes and goes around here is that why you're there to watch crook went white at that you're dreaming says he very faint and you're lending me the buckskin running mare for tonight i've heard of that mare is that the sort of thing to lend to a stranger well sir even a hired man may have his private feelings look here youngster i've seen you before and i remember you now when i saw you once at holy cross you had two eyes in your head and you weren't a cripple suddenly jim snatched away the black pad which was slung over crook's disabled eye two good ones shone out and over one of them the scar of an old wound jim laughed at that but crook forgot to be lame starting back lithe as a panther and his face dead white be careful he whispered there's men passing us my life ain't worth a cent if i'm seen here in town he had the sling across his eye again and broke out laughing <laughs> i mean the doctor says i've got to keep it covered or i'll go blind and a blind man's life ain't worth one cent in the dark quit lying you're posted at the stable to see who comes and goes one eye in a sling and one game leg for disguise come here jim dragged him by the scruff of the neck to the post office which stood next door to the saloon with only the alley between and there was an old poster notice on the wall notice the northern pacific and wells fargo express companies offer two thousand dollars two thousand dollars dead or alive for the four robbers who held up the northern pacific express train at gold creek deer lodge county montana on the morning of april third eighteen ninety nine descriptions peter alias bobby stark alias curly mccalmont supposed to be son of captain mccalmont is five feet six inches in height slim fair hair blue eyes clean-shaven soft girlish manner with a scar over left eye the result of a knife wound he is about twenty years of age but looks not more than fifteen and was formerly a cowboy riding for the holy cross outfit in arizona he was last seen on or about may fifth at clay flat in the painted desert with a flea-bitten gray gelding branded x on the near stifle and two lead burrows one of them packed jim turned round sharp on crook you're curly mccalmont says he come away you're risking my neck do you think i'd sell you for that dirty money what you seen others may and they'd act hate strong all right curly don't you forget to walk lame hist here come the rhymes the two youngsters came hurrying into the saloon where i stood watching val shannon while he lost the last of his money jim clutched me by the arm whispering something but i did not catch what he said for curly was making a last play to get val shannon from the tables you quit said he before you're too late patron it's too late now says val shannon what's the good it's not too late to save your life come quick so says belshannon looking up sort of surprised you think you can er frighten me 
louisiana was leaning forward across the table look a here crook says he you can play or you can get right out but you don't interrupt this game and curly was hustled aside by ryan's watchers now joe the patron was saying let's finish this he staked his last chips and lost then got up with a little sigh thinking i reckon of his wife his ranch his cattle i'm kind of sorry duke says louisiana so am i a little balshannon chuckled i think says the gambler stacking away his great big heaps of gold and silver coin i think that you are fortunate pete balshannon answered lightly i dare not think i'm closing the game for tonight says louisiana i'm closing the game tonight says lord balshannon he took a cigarette case from his pocket but found it empty felt in his shabby old clothes for money then turned away with a queer little laugh of his which made me ache outside in the street i heard a handbell clang and took notice through the tail of my eye that the room was filling with all the worst men in that bad town of ours there was the alabama kid and beside him shorty broach stage robber and thug beef jones the horse thief gas a tin horn crook thimble rig phipps and two or three other sure thing gamblers rollers and thugs i went over to the front end of the house where the orchestra were packing up to quit and there at the far corner of the bar were old ryan and michael standing drinks to the crowd yes the game was being set sure enough i saw low-lived joe hurry past me and speak in a whisper to ryan and at that balshannon's enemy stood out to the front of his gang all the scrubs and skin game men were drifting into that corner behind him until there must have been perhaps thirty gathered loosing their guns to be ready by the faro tables were jim and curly trying to get balshannon out of the house but he broke away and they followed until he came to the inner end of the bar then they stood back a little while he waited to be served here bill he called out cheerfully a barkeep quit the ryans and went to serve him well says he heaps insolent what do you want the patron looked at him smiling you seem out of sorts bill have a drink with me i'll take a whiskey the barkeep glared at him oh by the way says balshannon i'll have to square up for this tomorrow morning terms cash says the barkeep really balshannon smiled at his ugly face oh of course your orders eh well never mind you're so polite bill that er that just by the way of thanks i'll ask you to accept this little token he chuckled him the silver cigarette case and turned away from the bar but i was bull roaring mad patron says i patron i owe you heaps of money here take this but balshannon laid both his hands upon my shoulders smiling right into my eyes dear friend he said you know i could not take money even from you a thick voice was calling from the other end of the bar here barkeep you give this man a drink then the patron looked round ah uh, ryan eh he walked straight up to his enemy i'll drink with you gladly ryan suppose we forget the past and try to be good er friends eh he held out his hand but ryan took no notice hello i see your son is with you ryan good evening michael michael just stared at him the people who had no interest in the trouble must have seen drawn guns before now because i heard them breaking rapid for cover the scrub which belonged to ryan was formed up behind him for war while back of balshannon stood only jim and curly with the whole rear part of the room behind them empty the two youngsters seemed to be having baby troubles for curly was struggling powerful to break away from jim i got to go he shouted i can't see to shoot then he jumped clear he had disremembered about being a cripple he had torn the bandage away from his eye and over the left brow clear for all men to see was his brand the knife wound at that a yell went up from ryan's crowd and some of his men surged forward 
louisiana and low lived joe in the lead i jumped straight at them with my brace of guns back shouted ryan holding them back with both arms back back what's your hurry wait come on came curly's clear high yell two thousand dollars dead or alive if you take me i'm a sure wolf and it's my night to howl you cowards i'm curly mccalmont of the robber's roost take me who came curly had gone plumb crazy throwing his life away to get balshannon one more chance of escape but the crooks only saw that the small boy's team of guns were quick in his hands to shoot and felt real glad of ryan's outstretched arms so came the lull and i heard the barkeep clashing down bottle and glass beside balshannon whiskey he says in a shaky voice and yours mr ryan irish said ryan then whispered to his son who hauled clumsy getting out his silver-plated pop-shooter a thing more fit for a girl than a grown man i like to think of my old patron in those last moments of his life as he stood at the end of the bar quiet peaceful facing ryan he was a tall straight man gaunt some dead weary but the only clean thing in sight the gray moustache raked up against the red tan of his face his hair was curling silver his eyes cool blue he seemed to be amused with the rhymes and as to weapons he just despised a gun then he heard the clash of his son's spurs just behind him good-bye i heard him whisper god bless you jim i reckon jim was crying ryan had swung forward along the bar and reached for balshannon's empty glass here take your drink he shouted the drink you begged for balshannon stepped aside while ryan filled the glass for him to drink thank you he said but ryan snatched the full glass jumped back swung out his arm take that he yelled and threw the glass straight at balshannon's face the patron took a handkerchief and wiped his face slow and dainty but the blood was starting where the glass had struck i'm sorry he said that it should come to this but as you are not in condition mr ryan to fight i must ask you mr michael ryan to oblige me fight yelled ryan fight a thing like you not much back michael my lord balshannon he sneered do you think my son would demean himself to fight you i observe said balshannon kindly that he seems to be rather warm in that fur overcoat the crowd broke out laughing how freddy i felt then to take the weaker side against a coward the patron was so surely great so much a man so helpless death in his eyes peace on his smiling lips and the ryans and furs and jewelry looked such curves i had stepped back against the wall facing the middle of the bar on the right was the ryan gang on the left balshannon behind me the row of windows which looked on the alleyway where my men lay hid i rapped soft with my knuckles on the window just at my right hand say chalk louisiana was hailing me why don't you stand by the duke have you gone back on the duke i stand here pete said i to see fair play then ryan broke in on me boys he said we don't need chalk davies to judge our play you know me all of you you know my record and what i've done for our city i've not asked you here citizens to see murder or fighting of any sort but to witness an act of justice done by this lord balshannon on himself the crowd kept still remembering that our leading citizen had acted straight for our city and had a right to be heard now you shall judge as citizens said ryan between this man and me for a thousand years my people the ryans had land and homes in ireland until the balshannons came over with bloody cromwell to steal our little holdings by force of arms we were overpowered we were forced to pay rent to the tyrants but we were free men not slaves we are free men today and we have fought for liberty look at this last balshannon 
this man who once tried to get me hung on a false charge this cowardly brutal ruffian who drove me and all my people out of our homes to die in the bitter cold think of our women starving to death in the snowdrifts and if you doubt me go and ask my wife we were driven she and i and all our people out of the land we loved out of erin beggared hopeless despairing exiles out on the black atlantic we had to bury one of our little children in the sea there stands the murderer do you blame me citizens for wanton vengeance duke says the alabama kid suppose we hear your side you'll hear my side says lord balshannon from ryan this is his court of er justice then he wiped the running blood from his cheek and yawned behind his hand even ryan's men began to look ashamed of such a court vengeance ryan was howling vengeance with the apaches first i turned them loose on your camp vengeance with mccombus robbers i turned them loose on your ranch balshannon swung half round and grasped curly mccombus hand we saw his back shaking with laughter but when he faced ryan again he straightened his lips excuse me he said go on but the crowd remembered how McCalmus wolves had breakfasted with Ryan after that little dinner at Holy Cross. They howled with laughter. "'You may laugh,' yelled Ryan. "'Laugh, you hounds!' But Balshannon lifted his hand, and the crowd were silent. "'Yes, I failed,' said Ryan. "'I had to wait. I waited. But what I couldn't do, you did for yourself.' yes you balshannon drinking and gambling here while your forsaken wife lay dying yonder i had only to find a few friends to lend you money and sharpers to be after rooking you of all you borrowed yes that was me vengeance can you say that failed where is your big estate where are your cattle where is your wife balshannon's face had gone dead with pain but he never flinched and now ryan shouted at him you beggared gambler you broken shaking drunkard you shall finish this vengeance on yourself which you began which needs no hand of mine here he ran forward and jammed a long knife into balshannon's hand finish kill yourself and have done for sure and you're not fit to live you filthy beast balshannon was really faint sick clinging to the bar for support. "'Boys,' I shouted, "'if Ryan's a man, let him fight. Stand aside. Give him room. Give him a gun. Patron, take this gun.' I jumped to his side, jammed one of my revolvers into his hand, then leapt back to my place by the wall. Ryan's ten horn pits had deserted him. Even his son, scared to death, had slunk away. "'Help!' Ryan was screaming. "'Martha!' but a gun was thrust into his hand, and his own hired thugs shoved him forward to fight Balshannon. "'When I call three, I shouted, and saw Balshannon stand like a man, cool, steady. One, two, three. Ryan fired and missed before my second call, but at the three, Balshannon's gun blazed out. I saw a little black hole between Ryan's eyes, and he fell forward all in a heap, stone dead i reckoned that for years i'd been heaps virtuous keeping my quick gun off balshannon's meat so now i was full of joy because the patron had finished up all the unpleasantness and made peace without loss or damage no grown responsible man had any quarrel left but then my youngsters weren't grown up a bit nor responsible nor anything else but rattled with a gunfight too rich for their blood. Curly was scared all to pieces. Jim was right off his head, and as to my three kids outside the window, they had no sense anyways at their best. I ought to have thought of that before. It was too late now. What matter if young Michael eased his feelings by emptying off his toy at the patron? His pellets chipped the ceiling and did him credit for a pious son but only got a laugh from Balshannon. Michael just went on popping, ostentatious, so Balshannon showed he bore no malice by throwing his own gun on the bar. Then somebody called out for drinks as a sign of peace. 
but jim only saw his father being attacked and he surely never had a sense of humor he turned his wolf howl loose and broke his gun arm free from curly's hold then started splashing lead at michael ryan i saw some fur fly off from the jew coat and the next shot dispersed young michael's hat but the third struck low lived joe on the shoulder then there was surely war for louisiana loved that joe more than anything else on earth and all his friends lashed out their guns curly knelt quick below the blast of lead and jim leapt sudden behind the end of the bar but in a blaze of flame and rolling smoke i saw balshannon clutch both hands to his heart then swing half round and fall it must have been then that poor curly fired the two shots which killed louisiana and beef jones the horse thief it must have been then that the window close behind me fell with a crash of glass upon the floor and my three men all masked with guns and rifles poured red-hot slaughter into the ryan crowd that was bad but i felt grateful then while one by one i shot out the swinging lamps which lit the smoke there were five making so many shades of deeper gloom and then dead blackness pierced by flaming guns and at the end of that silence with a patter of running feet the groan of a dying man end of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of Curly by Roger Pocock. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perrard. Chapter Twelve: The City Boiling Over. Once I remember seeing an old bear roped in the desert by cowboys and dragged by the scruff of his neck into the fierce electric glare of a western city. Some female tourists said he looked dreadful rough. A schoolma'am squealed out he was dangerous. A preacher allowed he was savage, but nobody made excuses for that old bear. Now, I reckon that I'm just like Mr. Bear, dragged sudden off the range into the indecent light of civilization. Nobody is going to make allowances for me if I look dreadful rough and savage and dangerous. I own up I've no excuse bear and i were raised outside the prickly fences of your laws beyond the shelter of your respectable customs exposed to all the heat and cold the light and darkness the good and the bad of life bear he has teeth and claws as i have horse and gun but both of us fight or go dead for that is our business if you're sharp quit reading but if you want more, read on. When I knew that Balshannon was due to be shot, I set a trap, and all the desperados at Grave City walked right into it. I had the men picked out who would make a good loss, sent out the invitations to them in Ryan's name, and had a handbell clanged to call them in for the ceremonies. If Ryan only played fair, there would be no killing but if he acted foul there was going to be a sure enough massacre why it was only right that on the death of a great chief like balshannon servants should go with him to the other world that was all known to my three masked men in ambush and when ryan acted foul he was sent with louisiana beat jones and four others all desperados to wait upon balshannon beyond the flames and smoke of his funeral honors for a naturally cautious and timid man i took full risks in exposing curly to that danger but honest range-raised fighters are more than a match for the drunken town swabs who had to be dispersed besides my youngsters were not the kind to stay put in a place of safety after the fight if there was one, I knew that the fire bail would call up the whole of the citizens, and the news would spread swifter than flames of masked robbers attacking a saloon right in the middle of their peaceful town. They would be displeased, and rather apt to send in their little account to me, 
which made me blush to think of because i lay myself out to be a modest man when i got through with shooting out all the lights my men quit firing to haul me through the window now all four of us were in the alleyway between the saloon and the post office barred off from the main street by a high gate while our line of escape was open to the rear being shy of recognition i tied on a mask and reloaded my gun planning the next move rapid in my head then i called off my men to the tail end of the house posting one to kill anybody who tried to get out by my window i was scheming a raid into the house to rescue curly and jim but just for a moment my riders hung back scared come along you tigers says i there was no need to risk our lives for through the black silence of the house came a sudden blaze of guns and rush of men curly and jim had broken cover at last so we had only to let them come rolling out head over heads in no end of a hurry as soon as they were clear we handed in lead to the crowd stampeded them and sprinkled their tails they were surely discouraged the next thing was to mount our horses and reload guns while we rode off slow jim was shaking all over curly was sobbing aloud monty one of my boys was groaning because a bullet had burned his cheek you breathing like a gone horse and custer making little yelps of joy all of us scary as cats with our nerves on the jump the same being natural after a red-hot fight we pulled out by the south end of the city now said i you curly and you jim light out ahead and keep a flying for old mexico curly howled we ain't going to leave you i had to make my meaning quick and plain before he knew i was earnest as to jim i cut his words dead short and so they quit me streaking off to the south now you all i turned to my tigers custer let out his yelp and ute grinned ugly and both of them thought all the world of me for getting them into trouble monty says i go home and fix that wound he circled off well says i if you other two play any more tiger tonight i'll rip your lives out you've got to be plumb good citizens cause them people in the sepulchre have seen about ten masked robbers which they'll surely hunt so off with them masks quick and i threw mine in the road now says i we'll see if the general public is going to help us to get them robbers and kill them so we three trotted grave and innocent up main street where scores of citizens were saddling mounting and gathering the swift men calling the laggards in the lead rode deputy marshal Pedersen, coming on rapid hello he called you chalkeye i swung in beside him what's the delay says i how many robbers ten masked men come on they're mccormick's gang custer and me were calling the rest to hustle ten masked robbers they shouted heading down for naco thought you was in the sepulchre says Patterson. i was till i'd shot out the lights says i them crazy idiots there were handing out lead at me where did you see them robbers in the back street they wounded my boy monty so i had to send him home say look at that ahead on the white road plain in the moonlight lay something black so i swung down my arm in passing and took a grab what do you make of this eh patterson a silk mass says he thanks chalkeye you've got us on the right trail anyways but watch these tracks say i look there they're quitting the main road swing out curly and jim had struck straight south down the road so i pointed the whole pursuit well off to the right southwest for naco 
and made believe i saw another mask among the stones if dangerous robbers were hard to see through the moonshine that was no fault of mine if the citizens wanted to go riding out by moonlight i surely gave them heaps good exercise meanwhile that curly was herding jim down towards the mexican boundary but both the lads were rattled and their nerves had gone all to smash jim had dumb yearnings to go back and eat up citizens curly was trying to cry with one lip while he laughed with the other then jim told curly not to be a coward and curly laughed with the tears rolling down his face i wished i was dead he howled i wished i was dead i done murdered beef jones and there's his old hoss a waitin to take him home he loved that hoss and you a robber says jim mighty scornful jim had only courage a thing which is usual to all sorts of men and beasts but curly had something bigger brains judgment the lion heart the eagle sight the woman gentleness a child's own innocence and heaven's unselfishness i'm sure coward he sobbed brace up youngster i saw you kill both beef and louisiana but now you're gone all rotten between the eyes i got pete between the eyes i seen his eyes going up all white the hole between oh how i wished i was dead poor little beggar and one would think this was the first time you'd ever seen a gunfight i never seen one never until now and you mccalmont's son you needn't let on to him that you seen me human why wow. he braced himself up i'm only a range wolf so what's the odds jim well what's wrong now do you know you're outlawed too old chalkeye masked his riders he played robbers i showed wolf and you're done branded with the range wolves now jim swung round in the saddle looking back at grave city a bad sample surely among cities but still entitled to wave old glory high the flag of honest men of civilization he set his teeth and swung to his trail again if honesty is that says he determinedly i've heard with thieves i don't like the smell of this trail says curly none the city marshal is riding up from bisley with his posse let's strike west then circle the town then north to father's camp come on says jim and swung his horse to the west along a small dead trail we got to change ourselves says mccalmont's son and began to lose some parcels tied by the strings to his saddle i got some clothes for we all here he passed over an old leather jacket a straw sombrero and a bottle that's coffee extract says he mixed with a black drug i boiled it strong you rub it over your face and neck and paws then rig yourself our people at any gate in the saddle are broke to eat dinner drink from a bottle roll a cigarette or sing a song without being jarred up like a tenderfoot so while they trotted slow jim stained his hide all black like a greaser vaquero then slung on the char clothes of a poor mexican cowboy now says curly you take this mustache and lick the gummy side stick it on your lip and remember you're a dago say pull up they'll know that buckskin mare of mine for sure there ain't another in the united states i reckon with white points like her you empty that bottle and black her white stocking quick curly was changing too for he pulled up the legs of his overalls then wriggled them down over his long boots then he took jim's cowboy hat and slouched the brim down front like a hayseed boy he put on a raggy old jacket and bulged his lean cheeks out with pads of wool he looked a farm boy and when they rode on sat like a sack of boats it won't work says jim here's a big outfit of people sweeping right down from the north 
our horses are blown and their snort will give us away that bash all read says curly that wouldn't pass for german says jim not even in a fog sure says curly it's a me for getting me nativity ain't i orierish they had entered the naco trail by this and were walking their horses up the hill for grave city if the silly kids had obeyed my orders we should never have seen a hair of them that night as it was deputy marshal patterson and i came with full thirty men on top of them i don't profess i knew either the irish hasty boy or the vaquero until the black horse a melancholy plug called jones which i had lent curly began to wicker to the gray mare i rode patterson too was mortal suspicious of that buckskin mare with jim black points says he that so crooks had white legs sure said curly prompt and is it them robbers you'd be after hunting patterson reined up they've passed you eh he called they didn't shoot me says curly till i'm killed entirely there was eleven of them again me and the young feller that was along with me the rapscallions and them with black masks on their dirty faces how long since three minutes gone your honour and can any of ye tell me if this is the road to mr chalkeye davies patterson had spurred on and we swept after him leaving mr curly mccormick howling irish curses because we hadn't pointed him on his trail to las salinas we were scarcely gone when a second outfit of five stragglers came rolling down the trail headed by shorty broach one of the men who had been hurt that night in the gunfight he always hated balshannon's folks worse than snakes he was heaps eager now for curly mccormick's blood and the two thousand dollars which went along with it but worse than that this shorty was a sure plainsman who never forgot a horse still he went past with his crowd before he saw anything wrong with that black horse i'd lent or the buckskin mare jim was riding then he swung hold on boys say i knows that buckskin that's crook's buckskin mare at the livery here's curly mccormick's mare the riders tried to call shorty off told him to soak his head remembered that crook's buckskin had white stockings whereas this mare's points were black which made all the difference them horses is blown they're run full hard says broach they've been surely chased and i'm due to inquire more on that the riders began to circle around while curly slung out irish by the yard about running away from the robbers sure says he and it's the chief of the police no less we're talking weed throw up your hands says broach pointing his gun on jim but the youngster was busy rolling a cigarette why is that gringo showing off with a gun he asked in spanish he looks so foolish too you got to account for that buckskin mare says broach but jim set in the cool moonlight and lit his cigarette taking no notice this greaser is lately an orphan sir says curly and he's only going innocent for a drunk in grave city manning no harm at all where did he get that buckskin it's the pitchfork mare ye'll be manning sir at last jim knew the brand on the mare he was riding and dade says curly hasn't you got an holy cross brand on the shoulder as well sir maybe he stole her there if you want to live mr greaser you'll account for that buckskin mare broach threatened again with his gun i understand says jim in spanish puffing his cigarette at shorty's face i took this mare in trade at la morita custom house on the line of a caram americano could not pay the hundred percent duty on his horse 
so i traded with him my mexican branded mustang to oblige taking this mare she's branded holy cross rebranded pitchfork perhaps the gentleman will stand aside i have explained all very well said brooch in spanish which sounded rough like a railroad accident how do you account for that saddle jim de chesney's silver mounted saddle si senor the saddle of my young lord el senor don santiago of holy cross the caballero ordered me to bring these that he might play bear before the house of a beautiful lady in grape city and your own saddle alas i played poker with the americanos they have skinned me jim made a little flourish twisted the mustache it came off in his fingers and with a howl the whole crowd closed in they had captured jim du chesney and kerr mccallum end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of Curly by Roger Pocock. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Barrar. Chapter Thirteen: The Manhunt. I reckon that civilized folks are trained to run in a rut, to live by rule, to do what's expected. If they're chased, they'll run. If they're caught, they surrender. That's the proper thing to do. Our plainsmen. He's a much resourceful animal. He never runs in the rut, and he always does exactly what's not expected. Here were Jim and Curly, surrounded by five men all hot for war. Broach could shoot good, but his horse was a plumb idiot when it came to firing. He was scared he would miss Jim and get the counter jumper who pranced around behind. Of the rest, one was a railroad man and useless at that one was a carpenter and one was a barber all of them bad shots still they knew that their prisoners could neither fight nor run the prisoners did both most sudden and heaps surprising while jim's mustache was dropping curly's first bullet got broach's horse in the eye sending him backwards over on top of the man Jim unhorsed the railroad man, the carpenter disabled the barber, and the counter-jumper bolted. That posse was all demoralized, shooting liberal, attracting heaps of attention. So another belated outfit of citizens came whooping down the road, while at the first sound of battle, the crowd I was with swung round at full gallop to share the play. I knew my youngsters were in foul bad luck. Yet, in a single evening, these two had got to feeling each other's thoughts, acting together without talk, partners like the hands of a man. They knew that for them it was death to show on the skyline, sure good scouting to jump for the lowest ground and keep the dust a-rolling to hide their movements. They struck a gully, and Jim led over rock and cactus, riding slack rain, trusting that buckskin mare after the first five minutes looking round he saw the belated outfit along the skyline following and heard the whoops of our crowd closing in on the left i reckon says curly they'll get us very awkward says jim say curly he called out there's a fence here somewhere on chalkeye's pasture it's broken where it cuts this arroyo but just where why here where wire the mare took a stumble but cleared the fallen wire the black horse just jumped high up on the plain above the pursuit was going to be checked by my standing fence we're plumb in luck to the lips says curly and now the rocky hollow widened out the trail was smooth the pace tremendous while our citizens behind were having a check betwixt rock and wire jim struck the further gate of my pasture and held it wide for curly horsemanship had given the partners a mile of gain but now on level ground where any fool could ride our posse gained rapidly 
for the youngsters had to go moderate and save their horses down on your hoss says curly you ride too proud and a spatter of blue lead made jim lie humble the fool gallopers were right handy for war when sudden the winding valley poured out its fan of debris upon the lower plain towards mexico here just below the mouth of the arroyo a railroad track swung right across the trail on a high embankment on the nigh side of the embankment ran a wagon trail climbing a hill on the left to cross the track and that was sure foul luck for jim and curly for now they rode out clear against the sky in a storm of lead and began to reckon they was due at the big front door of heaven jim was all right in a moment for the buckskin mare just rose to the occasion left the rails and got to cover down the bank beyond but curly's horse was an idiot at the sight of the gleaming rails he stopped dead to show himself off shied bucked pawed the full moon fell in heaps tumbled all over himself dug a hole in the ground with his nose and timed the whole exhibition to get curly shot the gallopers were right on to him before he chose to proceed with flints spurred bloody down the further bank jim circled back to the rescue hurt he called curly lay all of a heap on the saddle shoot he howled and flashed on across the plain jim got the gallopers stark against the sky at point-blank range and just whirled in for battle piling the track with dead and dying horses blocking the passage complete then he streaked away to see if curly had gone dead on jones's back five minutes after that deputy marshal pedersen and i came blundering into the wreckage he jumped through somehow leading eighteen men but i stopped to help a hurt man and used his rifle to splint his broken leg the fool gallopers were mostly wrung out and gone home or left afoot by jim the good stairs were on ahead but weary maybe it being late for pleasuring so i proceeded to have an attack of robbers all to myself with the wounded man's revolver and my own shooting promiscuous sure enough half a dozen of them bold pursuers came circling back to find out what was wrong when i had turned back with my idiots for home a ripple spread along the grass and air from the south then a lift in wind full strong steady as ice aflow cold as the wings of dead jim fought up wind battling at full gallop until he overtook the little partner then ranged abreast and steadied knee to knee nursing his mare at a trot the moon slid down flame red behind the hills the wind blew a gale the night went black the sky a sheet of stars jim had quit being tired for his body was all gone numb and dead so he felt nothing except the throb of hoofs astern then he heard a popping of guns faint in the rear and on that saw flashes of signal firing away on the right besides other gun flames back below mule pass he held his teeth from chattering to speak curly old chap they've wired for a posse up from naco and the city marshal's men are coming down from bisley they're closing in on three sides and we can't escape curly said nothing say curly you're not hurt mosquito bite said curly look a here jim if anything goes wrong you'll find the captain at la soledad tomorrow what captain my father i made him swear he'd wait how's your buckskin lagging she'll live through it all right don't you talk any more you're losing hope there's always hope said curly but them stars seem nearer to we all they were riding through greasewood bushes and long grass whilst here and there stood scattered trees of mesquite that made bad going for horses but when they swung aside for better ground they nearly blundered into an arroyo only the dawn gray saved my boys from breaking both their necks in that deep gap 
but now they had got to lose the sheltering darkness their horses were mighty near finished and three big outfits of riders were closing down all round them jim looked up at the sky to see if there were miracles a coming for nothing less was going to be much use then the naco people came whirling down on the right and the black arroyo lay broad across their hopes so they swung north to look for a crossing and were thrown right out of the hunt presently soon my youngsters had another big stroke of luck because the bisley crowd missed aim and had to swing in behind with the men from grape city jim says curly has they closed in yet our wind is covering all three outfits now then came a yell from behind for in the dawn the hunters had caught sight of their meat now close ahead loomed something white like a ghost and jim let out a screech as it reared up against him sudden as he shied wide and spurred he saw the ghost some better a lime-washed monument the boundary mark of old mexico saved he yelled they can't fall beyond the line they can't but they will says curly fire the grass jim grabbed a hair from the buckskin's mane took matches from his wallet and bound them into a torch struck a light to the tip and held it in his paws against the roaring wind then he made shift to swing himself down till the long grass brushed his fingers he dropped his torch beside a greasewood bush and cantered on with curly knee to knee that flicker in the long grass grew to a blazing star spread with the flaws of the wind swayed its small tongues to lick new clumps and pass the word to others just beyond the bush blazed up with a roar as only greasewood can and flung its burning sticks upon the storm so that the fire spread swift as a man could run over acres of greasewood to the east was mesquite bush which burns like gun cotton in a gale of wind but now the drop of the fire had made that gale a scarlet hurricane with the stride of a running horse which flushed the flying cloud rack overhead and made red day along the mountain flanks i reckon that if i'd happened with that outfit of hunters i should have known enough to bear east and circle round the blaze without loss of time but the leaders saw the burning mesquite grove and tried to swing west of trouble there the arroyo barred them and before they won to the other horn of the fire their horses had gone loco refusing to face the heat anyways they stampeded with their riders and i reckon those warriors never stopped to look back until they had thrown themselves safe beyond the railroad if they had come out for a man-hunt they got that liberal and profuse beyond their wildest dreams End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of curly by roger pocock this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. chapter fourteen the frontier guards well up to the windward of the range fire that fool horse jones came to a finish sudden all a straddle swaying nose down and blood a drippin so far curly had just stayed in the saddle from force of habit but when the usual motion stopped between his knees he surely forgot to be alive any more and dropped like a shot bird to grass as for jim he was too stiff to dismount but the buckskin mare lay down with him complete so he rolled from the saddle and managed to stagger around he uncinched jones's saddle eased his mouth of the bit loosed the mare's girth as she lay then knelt by curly feeling him over for wounds he didn't know until then that curly had a bullet in the right arm but all that side was in a mess of dry blood and when he cut away the coat it began to spurt he plugged up the hole made a bandage with his handkerchief twisted it up with a stick until the blood quit coming 
then rolled himself down dead asleep beside his partner the big gale roared overhead a haze of flying dust the country to the north was a flaming volcano the sky was a whirl of clouds all painted purple and crimson with the daybreak but my kids and their horses cared nothing more at all for storm or fire then the skyline along the east began to glow white hot burned by the lift of the sun and stark black against that rode a bunch of horsemen they were coming from la morita custom house to find out what sort of felons had set the ranch on fire they were mexican frontier guards their lieutenant told me afterwards that when they saw the played-out horses and those two poor kids who lay between them they thought the whole outfit must be dead they reckoned up jim for one of their countrymen and surely did everything in their power to act merciful fire in the range comes pretty near being a serious thing causing inconvenience to cattle apt to annoy settlers by burning their homes and cooking their wives and families naturally that sort of play is discouraged and the frontier guards was only acting up to their lights in arresting my youngsters still they didn't act haughty and oppressive but sent a rider off to fetch their wagon for the prisoners and meanwhile made camp and boiled them a drink of coffee the teniente woke them up gave them their coffee and told them their sins while the rest of the greasers talking all at once explained what their officer meant as to jim and curly they were interested in that coffee a whole lot and ready to excuse the frontier guards but the worries and troubles of a pack of greasers only made them tired so they told them not to fuss and slept through the rest of the sermon when they woke up again they found themselves in prison that calaboose at la morita is built on the usual adobe sun-dried brick with a ceiling of cactus sticks laid on beams to carry a couple of feet of solid earth a dobe house is the next thing to comfort in a climate like ours where the sun will scorch a man's hide worse than boiling water the frontier guards had laid clean hay on the dirt floor and hung an olla of water to cool in the draught but when my boys woke up they were sure puzzled for the night had fallen the moon was not yet stirring and the place was surely dark as a wolf's mouth stiff and sore from hard riding jim got up to grope in the darkness ravaging around in search of grub he found hay and water but nothing else so thought he must have been changed into a horse and set up a howl for corn then he attracted curly's notice by tumbling over his bed how many legs have you got says curly cause that's ample catch me some water Jim reached down the hanging jar, and Curly drank. I've been waiting hours for that, says he. Now, sluice my arm. Jim threw cold water on the wound. Is it very bad? he asked. It sure attracted my attention, Jim. Can I do anything? Yes, next time you're falling around, don't use my legs. They are private. Where is this place? Jim looked up at a window gap high in the dobe wall, and saw the starlight checkered with iron bars. Then, listening, he heard a muttering of Spanish talk, and noticed the door of the cell lined out with a glimmer from the guard room. It smells bad, like a trap, said Curly. I wonder, says Jim, what time they feed the animals. I'm starving. My two sides, says Curly, is rubbing together, and I'm sure sorrowful we done got captured somehow i remember now they gave us coffee they must have been frontier guards so this is la morita why did they gather us in we didn't spoil any greasers no but we fired the grass it was not their grass we set fire to arizona i don't think they mind says jim whose grass we burned they've got us and they won't worry about the details you see they've got to make a play at being useful old chap 
or else their government would get tired and forget to send their wages what will they do to us keep us three days to cool then find us guilty and send us down to fronteras i remember says curly when i was riding that year for holy cross i saw the little wayside crosses yes everywhere on the mexican side of the line the little wooden grave signs by the trail curly and jim sat there in the dark and thought of the wooden crosses they understood but i believe it's up against me to explain for folks who don't know that country you see there used to be only two industries in old mexico silver mining and stealing but most of the people made a living by robbing each other then the great president diaz came along who had been a robber himself he called up all the robbers he'd known in the way of business and hired them as a sort of mounted rangers and frontier guards to wipe out the rest of the thieves that made the whole republic peaceful but when there were no more robbers to shoot the rangers and guards began to feel monotonous the country being plumb depleted of game well thanks to diaz mexico has gone so tame that life ain't really worth living and the frontier guards are scared of being disbanded because they're obsolete likewise the mexican people are so humane that they don't allow capital punishment and the guards feel a heap discouraged about what few prisoners they catch their fearful pleas if they get a thief who doesn't happen to be their own cousin most especially if he's a white man real game and in season that's why they lash him hands and feet to a horse trot him off into the desert and take pot shots at him by way of practice afterwards they report him for attempted escape his relations are allowed to bury him comfortable and put up a cross to his memory that is why the trails along the mexican frontier are all lined with neat little crosses you reckon says curly that we'll have little crosses it's beastly awkward says jim but we've got to take our medicine and yet i dunno says curly thoughtful about those crosses if we get spoiled that way the united states won't be pleased you see there's a reward out for me and you're wanted bad so uncle sam will be asking mexico and say why did you shoot my meat the voices in the guard room had quit muttering but now a horseman pulled up at the front door buenas noches hombre and somebody answered buenas tardes senor then talked again in spanish can a feed of corn be bought here for the horse he arrives from brave city what news of the gringos muchos el senor don rex has been shot don rex has been murdered no it was a fight it must be understood that his son don santiago what el chico yes el chico jim had a few against the very rich senor ryan he hired ladrones from the north the robbers roost gang it is called to murder senor ryan it seems the ladrones wore masks and they were led by a young robber named curly for whom great rewards are offered two thousand pesos de oro dead or alive what a reward yes el chico and this curly led the robbers and they attacked senor ryan in the sepulchre saloon el chico killed senor ryan himself and wounded miguel his son there are many witnesses and a warrant is out against don santiago for that murder i saw the warrant but you say don rex was killed he also many others were killed in the battle curly shot louisiana and another also then these ladrones escaped from the city but the population you judge well corporal the population followed there was riding and yet these ladrones escaped so except el chico and curly the two leaders the posse caught them near las salinas and got their great reward two thousand pesos de oro but wait 
these two caballeros would not submit but fought and killed a lot more citizens yes even escaped they reached the iron way which runs down towards bisley and there again they fought terribly then the big posse chased them clear through to the boundary line they were not caught they fired the desert caramba yes stampeded a hundred riders you must have seen the fire at dawn this morning todos santos that was el chico santiago disguised as a vaquero yes and curly as a farm boy you saw them man we got them here in chains two thousand pesos de oro por dios you have made me rich with your news in chains corporal then they did not escape after all they fought like caballeros and now they'll be claimed for extradition taken back and hanged hombre that's no death for caballeros how did you ever take such fighters corporal oh just arrested them but they fought a hundred americanos yes yes but we are frontier guards me and another man we just arrested them that's all two thousand pesos they fought oh yes we had to disable one of them in fact i myself shot him through the pistol arm then they surrendered made their bow to force two thousand golden dollars miraculous well senor corporal may it be permitted to ask where forage is sold certainly step this way i pablo juarez rich two thousand santa catalina thou shalt have candles a box of candles the voices faded out and jim lay back wiping the sweat from his face Woof! then he burst out laughing the liars he howled the gentle earnest liars oh pat me curly for i'm weak the long-eared spavined sway-backed cock-eyed liars but curly was shy of spanish and wanted the news what liars everybody they're all liars the whole world liars liars they couldn't leave it to facts which are bad enough but they've lied and sworn to lies and perjured themselves with oaths the thugs the dirty barroom toughs selling their souls to that young ryan and made a remnant sale of themselves for witnesses that i murdered an old man what ryan it wasn't you who spoiled old ryan it was your father in honest fighting who cares for honesty when there's a millionaire to pay for souls in cash they swear that i hired you and all your robbers to have old ryan murdered then did the killing myself and turned loose your gang to massacre ryan's friends the cowards the lying cowards but them boys with masks was chalkeye's riders and he just covered their faces jim to save them afterwards and who'll believe that here's a millionaire to buy the witnesses the lawyers the judge the law the only men who was there and can't be bribed is that leery old cow thief chalkeye but he's mixed up with us and likely enough a prisoner by now do you think that a grave city court of justice would believe an honest man no we're trapped and we're sold and we're going to be butchered now well says curly in that slow soft way he had i allow it's done you good to turn your wolf loose and you surely howled it done me good to hear all the cussing said while i lay resting that's relieved me a lot and made me plumb forgetful of being in pain jim began talking haughty and wanted to know if curly liked the notion of being hanged that i surely do says curly very soft you see only a while back we was going to be taken out sudden and shot which it was a caution to yaller snakes only to think of that didn't make me happy a little bit but now we got more prospects a slow trial coming time to turn around in and think out how to escape that sobered jim but it made him hostile too youngster will nothing scare you he asked can't get a whimper out of you even for company's sake 
You're so beastly selfish. Curly rolled over, resting his face on his hand. I was raised that way, says he, very quiet. Going to be shot up or hung most of the time. It's a risky thing being alive when you come to think of it, eh? We all is mighty ordinary folks in a trifling sort of world, Jim, but I reckon it's sure nice being here. We got sweet range hay to lie on, in hopes of a feed in the morning. The place is sure quiet, but we can't complain of being dull. As to our little worries, I don't fuss about crossing the river until I've done reached the bank. I wish, Jim groaned, that I'd got half your courage. I've suffered some, says Curly, and I reckon that what you call courage is just training. Now you, Jim, you lie down and think about something to eat, and presently you're going to drop off to sleep, dreaming of good camps where there's feed and water. If that ain't good, I'll wake you up in the night so's you'll get two sleeps, which is even better than one. End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of Curly by Roger Pocock. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter 15. Mostly Chalk-Eye. The loss of my near eye has led to a lot of mistakes on my part, especially when I mistook the brands on cows and horses, thought they belonged to me, and adopted the poor lone critters. I've always been fond of animals, anyway. Again, I argue that a person with two eyes had ought to see much more truth than I can with only one eye. But I don't find that folks are liberal in making allowances. They call me hard names instead. Now, that was specially the case over the Ryan inquest. I testified that old man Ryan died a natural death, because it would have been completely unnatural for Balshannon to miss him at five paces. Moreover, as I saw things, Jim never fired at all until Ryan was dead, and only began to shoot when he saw young Michael turning loose for battle. Judge Sprinks, acting assistant deputy coroner, allowed that I had been a whole lot present at the fight and was entitled to my one-eyed point of view. But then he remarked to the jury that the witness was well known to have such a defective vision with regard to cows that the evidence was tarnished on the point at issue. Judge, says I, this is a court of justice, and I'd like to see everybody getting a fair show. Now, as judge, you're sure incorruptible and righteous. Come to the point, says Springs. But, says I, if Judge Springs finds that the late Mr. Ryan met his death in a fair duel with Balshannon, then... Well, then there's a citizen named Mr. Springs who's apt to be reminded by the Ryan estate that he owes a heap of money. On that, we had considerable rough house until the judge called the meeting to order. Then he remarked, sort of casual, that he knew a citizen named Sprinks who was apt to shoot at sight when he met up with a certain notorious horse thief called Chaka Davies. So my evidence for Jim was set aside. I was pitched out of the court and for the next few days had to keep a wary eye on citizen Sprinks. He was an awful poor sportsman, and mostly always missed, but once I got a bullet through my hat. Afterwards, Mr. Springs admitted to his friends that he preferred a restful landscape and a less bracing climate beyond the range of my guns, so he pulled out for Yuma, and I saw his kind face no more. Now, I don't want to say anything unkind about Judge Springs or his jury, or his witnesses in that inquest on Mr. Ryan. But for Jim's sake, it is needful to point out some facts which were remarkable. Of the people who stayed in the sepulchre saloon to attend the gunfight, eight were unable to testify, being dead. 
three because they had gone to hospital two because they were engaged elsewhere at la morita and one which is me on account of defective vision of the rest the most part lit out from grave city and totally disappeared there remained mr michael two bartenders and four other citizens the only people who gave evidence these witnesses swore on oath that jim came to the gunfight attended by curly mccalmont and ten masked robbers they also swore on oath that jim fired the first shot killing mr ryan the court returned a verdict that george ryan came to his death at the hands of james de chesney and recommended his arrest upon the charge of deliberate willful murder i am not complaining the court represented the majesty of the people and that august flag old glory waving above us it was a right enough court even if justice had strayed out and got itself lost for a while i make no complaint because i reckon that a still mightier court than ours is sitting up above the starry sky to watch over fatherless kids who don't get a fair show on earth to save them as gets desolate and oppressed to vindicate justice upon low-lived swabs liars and cowards i said nothing but just stayed good and acted responsible being in a minority of one against the entire city the only time i ventured on any remarks was when i happened accidentally to meet up with mr michael he the mayor the city marshal and a few friends were taking a drink together at the hotel good morning ryan says i but i kept my voice all smooth for fear of rucking up my temper to no advantage good morning sir says ryan i come to congratulate you says i on the hearty liberal way you've been acting i thank you mr davies says he sort of ironic don't mention it says i for i ain't done no kindness to you and i don't aim for cash or thanks in what i say he reached for his gun which was hazardous and apt to get fatal only the city marshal grabbed him before i had to fire let me be says ryan this man insults me no says i that would be impossible i only congratulate you on the whole-hearted generous way you assisted a destitute judge and them poor hungry witnesses easy my friend says the marshal i'm most deaf but if i hear any contempts of court if you're feeling any contempt of court mr city marshal you shares my emotions and you gentlemen I turned on the crowd. If you feel any shame for the city and for any of the present company, I can only say I share that shame most bitter. The air was getting sultry with just a faint flicker of guns. If any of you gentlemen, says I, is feeling unwell for pills, just let him step outside with me and I'll prescribe. If not, excuse me for i smell something dead in this company and i'm aiming to refresh my nose in the open i pace back step by step through the door my address says i if i live will be las salinas and there you'll find a man who can't see to tell the truth but can see a whole lot to shoot gentlemen adios so i got on my horse swung to the saddle and walked him backwards until i was out of range but nobody offered himself up to serve for my target i reckoned that the funeral ceremonies in honor of the late mr ryan and friends made an event in the annals of grave city the caskets and wreaths the hearses and carriages the band and procession made the people feel uplifted with solemn pride and haughty to strangers for a full month afterwards as the weekly obituary pointed out in large type the occasion was great and a city which had flourished for twenty-two prosperous years was able to give points to mere mushroom towns like bisley benson and lordsburg 
the newspapers in those three rival burgs made light of the affair in a way which displayed mean envy and nasty carping spirit as for me i had got myself disliked a whole lot so i felt it would be most decent not to attend the exercises i had a feeling that if called upon to reply to any shooting i might disturb the harmony which should always attend a scene of public grief besides that it fell to me to arrange the burial of my old patron which it was difficult the preachers coffins hearses carriages and all the funeral fixtures being engaged that day and likewise also the graveyard i had to go without moreover the cowboys were mostly away at work on the round-up so i only caught eight of my tribe to help me we laid our friend on a blanket then four of us gripped the corners up to the horns of our saddles and rode slow the other boys coming behind until we got to the place where we had dug the grave there was only one man of us all well educated and that was monty who had been raised for a preacher before he broke loose to punch cows monty was shot in the face weak and feverish so i had to feed him whiskey before he felt proud enough for his job he read the service the rest of us standing round and when he was through we fired a volley before we filled the grave and piled rocks to keep off wild animals that was a proper stockman's funeral away out on a hilltop in the desert and i reckon the great father in heaven knew we had done our best in a brave man's honor End of chapter 15chapter 16 of curly by roger pocock this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by Matt Perot. chapter 16 arranging for more trouble see what the geography book says about arizona the same size as england shucks there's homely ignorance from an office duck who dreams he can use a tape measure to size up a desert in england if you wander round after dark you're apt to fall off and get wet in the ocean but you can sure stray off the edge of arizona without the least chance of a wet because the desert just rolls on more continuous than ever till you're due to die of thirst there's a practical difference in size which your book theorist wouldn't be apt to survive again by the books we're a community of sixty thousand pink and white citizens all purely yearning for right and justice by the facts we're really split up into two herds the town men who use the law and the range men who naturally prefer a six-gun i aim politely to say the best i can for the town men you see if a gentleman feels that he's just got to waltz in and rob the graves of his own parents one may not understand his symptoms but one has to try and think of him charitable our town men has mostly been found out acting self-indulgent and been chased around by the police that's why they flock to arizona which is convenient at the gates of hades with the breath of flame by way of excuse for a climate there's a sort of comfortable smell your future home feeling about old arizona which attracts such ducks anywhere else they would get their necks stretched but in arizona they can elect judges and police out of their own tribe then if they happen to indulge in a little bigamy or thieving or shooting the lawyers get them off they love the law which proves them up innocent so you may class them all as law-abiding citizens now as to us plainsmen the bad side of us is plumb apparent to the naked eye and if there's a good side it's known to our friends not advertised to strangers we ain't claiming to be law-abiding citizens when we know the judge for a sure thing politician the lawyers for runaway jailbirds and the jury all for sale at the rate of a dollar a thief 
we are lawless sure enough until we see the law dealt out by honest men are you fed up with one-eyed sermons from a cow thief well suppose we apply the facts here was two boys of our tribe bogged down to their withers in trouble the town men howled for their blood young ryan offered plenty wealth for their raw scalps the law claimed them for meat and every plainsman on the range got right up on his hind legs for war to our way of thinking robbery and killing are bad medicine but innocent holy joys compared with arizona law so naturally by twos and threes the punchers quit work on the round-up to come and smell at old grave city and find out why she'd got a swollen head they hung around saloons projecting to see if something had gone wrong with the local breed of whiskey they gathered and made war talk in the street they came around me wanted to know whether or not to break out and eat that town boys says i if you all stalks around with mean eyes and dangerous smiles these here citizens is going to hold up in their cyclone cellars and send for the army we don't want the army messing around our game just you whirl in now and play signs of peace and make good medicine lay low give your ponies a strong feed and wait for the night shock eye says one of them is this to be war if it was war i told him i'd first send you home to your mother no kid this is going to be smooth peace but we're going to knock grave city cold with astonishment get plenty ammunition feed your horse and wait my gathering howl for a signal it was high noon when captain mccalmont came straying down into main street on a painted horse at ryan's livery stable he allowed he was an unworthy minister wanting water and feed for the piebald pony at the delmonico pie foundry he let out that he craved for sausages mashed potatoes and green tea then he had a basin of bread and milk while he told the dish slinger a few solemn truths apple pie says he was a delusion eating tobacco was a snare intoxicating drink was only vanity on the lips but raging wildcats to the inward parts the proper doctrine says he is to eschew all evil but the wicked man leaves out that saving syllable s and chews evil all the time and then he allowed that a toothpick would do him no harm paid for his meat and strayed out across the street to where i stood dealing peace among the cowboys little sinners says he i perceive that you have fallen into evil company this chalkeye man is a pernicious influence which would corrupt the morals of a grizzly bear flee from this chalkeye person they wanted to take him into the nearest saloon and enjoy him for the rest of the day can you dance says one of the boys aiming a gun at his toes whirl right in and dance McCalmont walked right at him eye to eye and that same cowboy went as white as dead shall i abate you says the preacher in the midst of your sins you done wrong you done eat tobacco and chocolate candy mixed then poured on hot coffee rye whiskey and an ice cream soda and now you're white as a corpse with mixed sins go take a pill my son and repent before you're sick the boys watched that preacher smiling and went tame as kittens the tone of his voice just froze them up his smile scraped their young bones his eyes looked dead come chalkeye says he and led me off into the spur saloon there he threw a glance to cranky joe the barkeep and put his finger on mutiny robertson a smuggler who sat playing poker cranky put someone in charge of the bar mutiny passed his game to a friend of his and both of them followed meek as she while the preacher led on into the back yard from there we worked round the back street to ryan's stable mccalmont keeping up his baby talk for the sake of passing strangers ah says he my young friends 
these deleterious pleasures change peaceful stomachs into seats of war but the sausage soothes the milk assuages the pie persuades and bar sign is sure good to fill up corners beware of vanities and when we get to the stable yard let mutiny here stand guard in case i'm attacked while i expound the blessedness of simple things well here we are you mutiny fall back you top-eared mongrel i'm dying for a chew of baccy and i'd give my off lung for a cocktail mutiny stood guard cranky hustled off to get liquor i got a line of retreat from here says captain mccalmont and a saddled hoss within reach no not that painted plug but a sure crackjack which can burn the trail if i'm chased how's things you chalkeye cloudin for storm says i the air's a crackling why for i told him about his son holed up in jail with jim at la Marita. i been projecting around thar last night the captain was eating my plug tobacco like bread was it you sent that doctor to curly's wound sure thing sir why grab my paw you're white all through says he that kid is all i care for in this world can they escape i dropped a crowbar through the window hole the guards will be full curious when they hear the crowbar thumping that's what's the matter i sent some holy cross greasers to feed them liquor games and music especially music will the frontier guards miss the big blood money for the sake of a flirt at skin games i reckon they'll watch and the crowbar is going to be heard so i've made a run to see you here comes cranky joe you trust him the sight of him makes my fur crawl here captain says cranky offering the cocktail but the outlaw bored him through with a cool eye my name says he is the reverend perkins and don't you forget now you'll send mutiny here and you'll stand on guard yourself if i get captured a friend of mine is to send your present name and address to the penitentiary where you're wanted most so here's to your freedom he drank and we watched the man sneak off i turned him out of my gang said the robber for being dishonest mutiny strolled in and shook hands old friend says he what can we do to help watch joe and shoot him up quick if he tries to pass that gate so mutiny pulled his gun how's all the boys he asked they're honing to come back to being a robber can't mutiny groaned i've sure repented and turned smuggler now besides i'm due to get married so i'm dead tame and gentle boss what brought you south you may inquire sir ain't you trusting me well mutiny since you want to know i came down to hold up a train big plunder i expect it was a carload of bird's teeth cat feathers and frogs tails but there's too many inquiry agents around so i miss the train mutiny had to laugh but then he sighed if anything goes wrong with my girl says he i'll come scratching your door while wow. the outlaw looked mighty serious if she happens to get drowned in the desert perhaps we'll see you come now let's to business them kids at la marita has to be collected i reckon why come to we all says mutiny ain't the gang handy at rescues my wolves would jump at the chance i choked them off for how the caves the captain turned his haunted eyes on me i don't want them poor youngsters mixed in with thieves you wanted me mixed again says mutiny through his teeth sonny the outlaw laid his hand on mutiny's shoulder you've been a bad egg same as me and we'd be hard to spoil but these eggs at la marita is new laid fresh eggs so i want them to keep you're right boss 
mutiny i sent you away for your good because that girl may pull you up if anything can't on errand as for me well i don't know as i care what becomes of me i tried mortal hard to run straight i envy every honest man i see i'm like a crawling snake ambitious for bird wings to fly with but still i'm no more than snake the kids have a chance all right says mutiny they have a year ago i couldn't have drove my curly away from the gang but now he's paired with that dude chasney youngster them colts won't care for the herd if they can run together so i've got curly weaned from following me to to damnation mutiny says i will you help me to gather in these boys i surely will says mutiny but hadn't we ought to wait until they're moved up this way for trial well says the outlaw if i can get to fight with a small man i don't yearn for anything larger whirling on la Morita and your fighting mexico wait for a move and you're up against the whole united states i'd rather have a licked little old mexico i told him that i had a town full of cowboys hard to hold that kind won't keep said mutiny what's your plan i aimed says i to steal young ryan and throw him into la Morita by way of consolation for them poor frontier guards when they miss their plunder now don't you touch my meat says captain mccormick i have to feed my little small lambs on him now mr davies answers to the name of chalkeye mostly wow chalkeye this is the second time we meet he bored into me with his eyes i understand that balshannon's will makes you some sort of guardian of his colt i reckon he needs a friend will you be a friend of my son not more than i've been already mutiny says he you witness that i captain mccormick thief and general manager of the robbers roost gang of outlaws appoints this chalkeye davies guardian of curly i witnesses moreover i am to corrupt this chalkeye by handing him stolen money he passed me a heavy roll of notes worth fifty thousand dollars which is ten thousand pounds by english reckoning my friend he said take these two kids away out of this country break them dead gentle keep them clean make them forget he gave me a letter read this when you're alone you trust me i asked you trust yourself mutiny says i you'll help poor mutiny said the robber might help himself on the dead thieving says mutiny that's so then he grinned at me look a here chalkeye this means that you'll pull out and hit the long trail now i want a home for my girl how much will you take for your ranch i'll see you later mutiny and talk and now shake hands mccormick tonight i'll be on hand like a sore thumb at la morita chapter sixteen